An oil slick from the Cedar has washed up along a 50 metre stretch of coast at Port Hellick Bay on St Mary's. A salvage the urgent concern at the moment is the 364 tonnes of heavy fuel oil which is sitting in tanks which are hold... When the Cedar sank and the Albatross gouged a 120 foot gash in her hull, it made international headlines. It's the freedom, you can, you can leave your door unlocked, you can leave the key in your car. You know, you can do what you like. You can walk into a shop and say, you know, oh, I've got no money on me. I'll be in tomorrow and walk out. You can't do that on the mainland. But how much do events like these really affect the islands and those who grow up on them? For two young girls, Silly was their playground and their history book. Their view from here coloured their judgment of the rest of the world. We used to build dens wherever we found a sort of uh, a rock or uh, you know a bit on the beach uh, we used to come up here to this rock and uh, sort of tunnel underneath it or uh, you know build things around it or um, sort of uh, protect it or uh, literally anything that we could think of just had to use our own imagination and see what we could come up with it was different I mean we used to go to school on the boat every day and we had to see around us all the time, so we just used to amuse ourselves sort of crabbing and making rafts and just playing down by the water most of the time, which most people don't get. So I mean, it, was very, it was a very nice childhood. We could go out by ourselves the whole time, we had our freedom, which is nice. I can't remember having any sort of big bust-ups or anything. I suppose at the time you think it's just not worth it because you can't sort of, there's not a big circle of friends to move around and uh, sort of find anyone else. And generally, because you're in such a situation as you're all thrown together to be friends together, um, I don't it's not that you try harder to be friends, but you just sort of rub along much more easily. You don't sort of, there's no splinter groups, uh, there's no sort of smaller groups to go off and find. You're, you're there together, so you get on together. So, um, that's just the way it, it's just the way it works. Because at the time you didn't really think about it. We're looking back now. You think, you know, you just all got on together and that, that was that, no questions asked really. The school, I mean it was it was nice for us. I mean the classes were very small and you only had two teachers between what the age of four or five to the age of eleven, which was a bit difficult. You didn't get much individual attention. So it was quite strange going away to school and to boarding school and having like 20 of you in one class and just to one teacher and it was, I mean we used to do swimming, go out swimming up to the hotel and do little, little things like that and have fates and break time we used to go and play in the, in the field just in front of us, in front of the school, which was fun. We used to have a little climbing frame. It's fun. We used to always go. Everybody. I mean, we could fit like the whole school on this climbing frame because there was only like 15 of you. <laughs> we learnt a lot about the islands, uh, you know, specifically about different islands and the history of it, rather than a sort of more general, sort of overall education as you might imagine, you know, mainland school would have. Um, and it was very small, and we had sort of the four junior years in one classroom, just sitting on the different tables to sort of. Um, which was which, and uh, I think the headmaster cared a great deal, a great deal about us, uh, and that's why he taught us so much about the islands. So he wanted us to know more about where we were growing up and uh, you know what its history was. It wasn't the greatest school ever. I mean, when I went to um, to the school on the mainland, they were quite shocked about the way things worked over here. I mean, you used to just get given a book for a lesson, and you just had to get on with it yourself, basically. And, you know, teach each other and talk to each other rather than not much individual attention at all. I mean, you got used to it, but it was, it was, wasn't, we were quite behind when we got, when we got to the other schools. 
Since Prue and Emily were at school, Tresco has learned its lessons. It has a friendly atmosphere, plus a good academic record. And they do have a quality of life, an environment where they really can be children. Um, the comparison I'd make from having worked on the mainland is that here they really do have a childhood. There is a certain amount of freedom that they can have here because it is a safe environment, it's virtually a crime-free environment that gives them the chance to really enjoy their childhood that maybe they don't at the moment on the mainland. So I think any, any isolation is we make a great attempt here through the schools and otherwise. Teachers spend a lot of time outside school as well as in school providing all kinds of clubs and activities and we do try and compensate for that but in the end I think the, the special nature of being brought up here on the Isles of Scilly does compensate for any isolation. You don't have to worry about, you know, a weirdo next door or anything like that. I mean, um, and the traffic, traffic free, so, you, you know, as long as they respect the sea, really that's the main danger, um, of falling off rocks or anything like that. But, um, great, really. I mean, they, we still get the I'm bored syndrome, whatever they say. <laughs> Two days into the holiday, I'm bored. <laughs> they just can't with some really horrific suggestions and they soon find something of their own to do. <laughs> And we used to go swimming when we got back from school. Like people would meet up after school and we'd all go swimming off this concrete key, like throw each other off and swim around, which was good. But, um, yeah, it was, it's, and the closeness of everybody here, that that's really good. It was everyone's very close, but oh, then you can't get away from get away from things. But yeah, so it's a bit like a massive family in its way. The history of Scilly is written underwater. For Salonians, it is a treasure trove. Apart from an abundant supply of fish to eat and admire, children learn that their ocean is an encyclopedia of events which have shaped their world. A vast amount of Silly's history really lies beyond most people's view. It's underwater. And a lot of um, not just Silly's history, but our whole sort of man's history is locked up in shipwreck, which is one of the nicest things about a shipwreck because when a when a vessel goes down, it's a sort of like a little time box of everything that was applicable on that particular day. And, I mean, this is uh, just interesting me at the moment because this is um, an area of cannonballs and uh, one of the weapons of war at this particular time, which is, this one's sort of late 18th century, um, they used to sort of wrap four or five small cannonballs up in a sort of canvas wrapper and here's some of that canvas and the whole lot is then tied together with this rope and those sort of four or five small cannonball are sort of put in a big cannon and fired as sort of anti-personnel weapon and you find uh, sort of a lot of lead musket shot that aren't actually 
for putting in a musket. There again, for putting in a canvas bag, stringing up, and, and sort of wonderful anti-personnel <laughs> weapons. So, you know, there is a lot of our whole national history locked up in shipwrecks. And of course, in Scilly, we've probably got more per, per square mile than, than most places in the whole of Europe. And then we have here two sets of navigational dividers. There's about 100 years between them. This, this pair off a British warship from the early 18th century, and this pair from the very late 18th century. Britain produced these by the thousand. And uh, some African chief went to war with his neighboring village and took a few prisoners and he got paid for each man's life one of these rather innocuous Birmingham-made brass tokens. And uh, that man was then shipped across to the Caribbean or America and sold for 20 or 30 pounds. It's, um, it's a part of British history, really. But of course, um, silver was fundamental to all world trade because it was the trusted unit for bullion. And here we have a piece of concretion and turn it over and you can see there are two they're Mexican pieces of eight. These up until 1732 were purely ingots of silver that were stamped and uh, they were pure and they were guaranteed minimum weight and they became the international trusted unit for all international trade. Ultimately these became known as, as Mexican dollars then just silver dollars and today we still do all our international trade. A lot of it is still priced in, in dollars. So pieces of eight have been part of uh, man's trading history for the best part of 500 years. Not everything which comes from the sea is welcome. When the CETA sank, its cargo posed a problem well beyond the scope of the islanders' buckets and spades. But it all makes work for the working Salonian to do. A colleague of mine rang me up uh, about quarter to six on that particular morning and said that, Mac, there's a moving big ship gone in on St Mary's. Um, can you get over? And I thought it was an April fall and he was about four days too early. But no, he was serious and we went over and uh, hell-bent on getting out there as quick as we could. And the harbour master was already on the quay and he asked us if we'd mind taking the captain and two or three of his crew out to the vessel. So obviously we did, but of course we get out there and the, the whole bridge structure was sort of half a wash. So uh, our first operation was, uh, under the captain's instructions, um, we recovered things like the ship's money, all the crew's passports, um, and assorted personal effects. Um, quite a funny story along with that as um, my colleague was actually in the water being directed by the captain as to where such and such was and he, he was speaking in quite good English and all of a sudden one of the guys who'd been exceptionally quiet the whole of the time getting out there he suddenly shouts to the diver oh uh, my my jacket is in the in the wheelhouse and at this the and the captain turned around and let out a right load of expletives saying, you just lost my bleep bleep ship and you want your bleep bleep jacket? <laughs> yeah, it was...
quite a, quite, a, quite a morning, because it was quite misty. And as we went out, I had the radar on. And it looked like what the M25 must look like, because there was all these blocks on the radar screen. Of course, it was containers. Probably we were taken off guard at the beginning, because when it first happened, five containers of this polyester film went down when the ship went down and, and disappeared. And it wasn't until some time afterwards when the containers started breaking open that the, the rolls of polyester started getting out and on the seabed and being rolled around and breaking up. And then the beaches around where the wreck was immediately became covered in, in little pieces of this polyester film. There, there are 340 rolls of the, of the film, each weighing about a quarter of a tonne. And containing several miles of film on each roll. Now, we've tried to minimize the damage. The, the problem is, as it unravels on the seabed, so it, it covers the marine life that's out on the seabed, and that smothers it and stops it getting nutrients from the sea. The second problem is that it, with all this plastic floating around in the water, it seems to have a neutral buoyancy. There is a danger that it'll be sucked into the uh, intakes of motorboats and uh, outboard engines. And then thirdly, of course, it, it ends up on the shores around the island and creates a, a, a real mess on, on the seashore. The cost and the time involved to the Trust has been immense, and this has affected the, the sort of work that we're doing uh, around the islands and has curtailed some of our normal work. Having removed the biggest threat to the environment, what remains is a deadly threat to the average Salonian's pocket, the tourist business. Tourists expect white sandy beaches and crystal clear water to swim in, plus an unlimited supply of hot water and a centrally heated cottage. The business arrives with great expectations. go to the beach you just have to walk and you wouldn't have to go kind of like a long way in the car to get to the beach. I think just the peace, the sea, the boats, freedom, no cars, walking, outdoor life. <laughs> I think it's really good. they leave the rubbish and pollution of the cities behind them, the islands begin to work their magic. But as the visitors are winding down, the workload for the islanders is increasing. A lot of, a lot of work goes into keeping paradise happy. And it's, it's roll your sleeves up type of work. It's, uh, it's very real. It, uh, this isn't a theme park. It's very, very real. Uh, it only, the only reason it's like the way it is is because people have made it this way and have not done things in some areas and have done things in others. You know, they've left the island as its own beautiful self, you know, because they have to anyway. And the estate has preserved as much as it could of the island culture and still having to bend to the demands of contemporary tourism. Yeah. Contemporary tourism does not turn a blind eye to the odd bit of flotsam and jetsam. One suggestion for paying the cleaning bills is to charge visitors a one pound landing fee. I think it'd be quite a very good idea. It would raise a substantial amount of money which could be used to protect the environment. Um, and I don't think it would be noticed if it were collected by the travel, um, by the transport operators. It would not be noticed. I mean, it's expensive getting here. One pound is so infinitesimal by comparison that people would very quickly not even realize it was a, a landing fee. I've never really understood the argument against it myself, um, and I'm not even sure what the argument is. I, I've uh, never heard a really cogent explanation of why people are against it. It's talked about for a number of years, and... Uh hasn't come in as yet, whether it ever will. 
I imagine people will still come here if, for an extra pound a head, whether they'll discriminate whether islanders will have to pay a pound a head to come back into the islands or not, I guess, remains to be seen. But or whether how much of a pound will actually go into the islands or used in administration would uh, be interesting to see. It's an ill wind that doesn't blow anybody any good. And although all that glitters may not be gold, it isn't entirely worthless either. Oh my God. Well, the um, city crashed by um, when it, um, there's, um, Hit the rocks. The, yeah. Um, ascot trainers, chemical, yeah, tires, um, rubber rings, things. Everybody took them home and played with them. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and, yeah, um, Microsoft. Um, Computer, computer, computer mice. Yeah, computer mice, computer mice and um, what's it? This is that computer chips. Everybody had a bit of a bonanza. But there was a tremendous kindred spirit amongst those that were, in effect, clearing the beaches because had they not taken it, then the sea would have. Um, and, and uh, I mean, some of the things that were little known, and that was the, the sort of women folk of St Mary's who who got together and a lot of the clothing, they actually stockpiled, laundered, re-ironed, and the whole lot was sent out to, I think, um, to orphanages in, in Romania. There was a tremendous amount of super um, generosity that the islanders did put in. And sometimes the press weren't always particularly fair to, uh, you know, a community that historically has always sort of needed the occasional shipwreck just to make, make ends meet historically. I mean, obviously that's not the case today, but it's part of a, a, of a long heritage of not just the Isles of Scilly, of, of, of every coastal community throughout, throughout the world probably. And I think that the CETA will be remembered for, obviously, the sort of problems that it brought, because it did bring a lot of problems, but also for the actual um, the excitement and the, the, the sort of change of the normal routine of life, but it also did a lot of good for community spirit as well. There was a lot of, a tremendous amount of good. The endeavours of the locals to, to save life was always paramount. And here in this bay, um, there's two of the old gig sheds. And when a ship called the Delaware she went down there just beyond Castle Briar, out between Mint Carlo and, and sort of Maiden Bar. And uh, I, it was obviously in horrendous weather, and the sort of people of Briar were watching this ship, realised that she wasn't going to be able to weather the islands, and they eventually saw her wreck. So they tried to launch the gig here, which they, they got it in the water, but the seas were so great at the entrance to the bay, they just couldn't physically get out. So they come back ashore and they carry that boat. I mean, this is a 30-foot boat. And they carry it all the way across to Rushy Bay, which was slightly more sheltered, relaunch it in Rushy Bay. They rowed across to the eastern side of, of Samson, carried it across Samson to launch it yet again on the western side of Samson. And they eventually rescued the only two survivors of, of the Delaware. Less than a month after the CETA sank, another shipping disaster dealt a direct blow to hundreds of tourists. There were 500 German, elderly German tourists on board, and they came within one inch, because that was the thickness of the plate, of sinking. And that would have been, obviously, a, a tragedy. And it would have also been a tragedy for Scilly because of the possible pollution that would have resulted. So we were very nearly reporting a story about a ship, incidentally, called the Albatross, um, which would have been, a, as I say, a major tragedy. And the first story was that they thought they'd hit one of the containers that had sunk as a result of the, of the CETA going in, what, less than probably a month before. So she was a big ship, about 30,000 tonnes, which is as big as we, really we get into the islands, and she was... Um, very traditionally built back in the 50s, so she was all a riveted construction, but quite a deep draft compared to modern cruise ships. 
we had to get underneath her and she drew about 30 foot but she she drew it right at, at the tuck of the bilge so you sort of went down this slab and then all of a sudden you went around and it was only once you got below that bilge level that you were aware of tide and of course it took you like a train and, and we obviously knew by then that the ship was holed and of course if there's a hole in the bottom of a container that's pushed down 30 foot water goes in it doesn't come out and it goes in a fair old rate so the last thing a diver ever wants to be done is sucked under so obviously we had a full team of divers working with support ropes from from this boat and we worked along and, and the, the the site really was quite amazing i mean the the, the rip was not absolutely continuous, but it's extended over about 140 feet and by about six, seven feet width. I think it could have been exceptionally serious because um, the keel was obviously a substantial piece of metal and the keel, you could tell when you looked under, the keel actually had hit the rock and later investigation of the rock, I mean, she took about six foot off of her. So had she been slightly better coursed and she'd have passed, but took the, the, the rock actually on, her, on, on the bilge, then the odds are she'd have ruptured the tank tops and uh, it could have been a, a, a major disaster. In winter, man-made disasters are the least of their problems. Concrete slipways, farmland and forests of trees which are hundreds of years old are blown to the ground and swept into the seas. Salonians may have grown used to it, but familiarity doesn't make their lot much easier. I think really it, you're a bit numb just by the sheer destruction of certain areas of woodland um, and certain, certainly, you know, these old trees that we've got on Tresco, they're like old friends, you know them all. And uh, when you lose that one, oh, you know, I remember that as a boy and it's that sort of thing that hurts. But to be honest, you know, you have to be objective and you've got to get on, you know, get up the next day, Monday morning, start clearing some of the paths, you know, start again. And I think, you know, in, in that way, a forester's job is just to sort of say, well, that's a shame, but, you know, it's time to move on, get some new trees planted, and, you know, it's a job. I mean, it's just the same as any other job. You get up and start again and, you know, have a go. Keep going, really. Simple as that. You know, I came here with, with my family when I was three, and um, I've been here ever since, you know, and, and love it. It's part of, part of me. Love it, you know. Smashing place to work and uh, smashing job. Growing trees, you know trying to sort of replace what I've enjoyed as a boy, really. You know, I played in all these woods when I was a kid, and, um, you know, it's nice to sort of just have a go to put it back for somebody else's kids, some, some, you know, in the future. When the weather's bad, you don't really leave the house. You're sort of stuck inside all the time. There's no sort of relief of going away somewhere. Just, you can't even, you know, pop into the cinema for a few hours or something, and go shopping to, you know, relieve the boredom, well, not the boredom, but the tedium of sort of being in the same place doing the same things all the time, um, you know, and as I say, when the weather was bad, not being able to go out to find you know, anything else to do. So that was fairly uh, trying in the sort of depths of winter. The frustration and boredom of being housebound in an isolated community can lead to mindless acts of vandalism. There was a certain amount of abuse, um, but I, I mean, it's... It's not a big thing, and I think just because you know somebody had knocked a hole in the plaster, somebody else sort of made the hole a bit bigger. But it, we've actually sort of had a working party on the community centre, and uh, we've sorted the problems out physically. And we're going to get the ho the, um, the the building sort of locked now. And uh, um, we, we've actually had a bit of damage in the storm, so we've got to sort that out as well. But uh, there, there is no vandalism over here, and there's you know no graffiti or anything like that, and no children sort of get into great mischief because everybody knows who they belong to and if anybody's you know, doing something out of order somebody will tell their parents so I think that was just a sort of a one off the community centre. The parents may do their best to control their children but the Atlantic is quite another matter. Keeping paradise spick and span during the winter is no mean feat. 
I think is a fairly typical island mentality. You don't dispose of anything because you might want it, want it in a couple of days' time. You can't pop round to the local ironmongers for anything, so you tend to sort of uh, don't chuck it away. Um, we're not as badly off for rubbish as we were because we now get our rubbish collected and most of it is taken to St Mary's. But um, there is still quite a lot of rubbish hanging around and we get a lot of uh, rubbish washed up on the uh, western shores. I mean, I mean, we can clean the shores uh, early in the season and a couple of days afterwards, if there's been a westerly gale, we've got a load of plastic and all sorts of rubbish there again. Not much we can do about that except pick it up. And pick it up they must. Scilly is not a chief island to visit or stay in, and their guests expect the best. Bad weather this season resulted in vacancy signs appearing in hotels and guest house windows during the peak season, with precious little time to make up the shortfall before winter. Everyone on Scilly depends upon tourism for a living in one way or another, but one man depends upon it more than most. Thanks so much. The Duchy of Cornwall is an estate that was established in 1337 by Edward III for his son, the Black Prince. It's one of the largest and oldest private landed estates, and it was set up to produce an income for the heir to the throne. And the property generally. And they are, each one of those is occupied. And the partnership is that we both have the same objective. Ours is to generate an income out of that ownership the occupiers, generally the business ones, are also wanting to get an income from their property. And it's a partnership that we both achieve our objectives in a mutually happy way. I don't think people perhaps mind so much not owning the land. It's a bit galling when you have you or your ancestors have built the buildings on the Crown land and in the end you're left with an annual tenancy. Uh, the duchy run as an estate for the Prince of Wales. I think that has had the advantage for the islands of stopping quite a, an amount of development over many decades. We, we have distinct roles and we function those roles well. It's a village with county council responsibilities. We're still 85% of it owned by the, the Crown. There are freeholds around, you know, um, which the Crown have sold. I'm not quite sure how that could change or how it should change. I don't really want it to change too much. I just, you know, there's, there's common sense in everything. And uh, I think common sense must pertain in running the arms, whether it's from the landlord's point of view, the tenant's point of view, or the council's point of view. Some duchy rents nowadays are, are fairly high. It's uh, difficult for people less are sort of renting a farm where they stand a chance of earning from the from the place they rent or renting a house large enough to take in guests but even then they pay I think some sort of a, a tax to the duchy for carrying on the business as it were letting out letting out accommodation well I think the community live with it they're used to it it's, it's what we do what we know, you know it's, it's it's probably gradually got busier over the years but um, Everyone sort of just in the swim, and you get on with it. I don't, I don't. You do get phases in the summer, I suppose. Where you, sort of, oh, well, I'll be glad when the winter comes. And then halfway through the winter, you'd be thinking, I'll be glad when the summer comes. So it's uh, <laughs> a double-edged sword. The Isles of Scilly were created millions of years ago. The plates above the ocean shifted and as they were pushed up to the surface, the whole thing broke into bits. No bad thing, you might think, looking at the end result today, but what followed was hardly less dramatic. Scilly was supposed to provide an income for the Prince of Wales, but by the time the pirates and smugglers had taken their share, he didn't see very much of it. Then along came a banker from the Midlands who changed everything. Augustus Smith was sent to Scilly to sort matters out and granted a 500-year lease on Tresco for his troubles. He organised the islands and the islanders with gusto. He bred livestock, started the daffodil industry and bred multicoloured rabbits. More recently, Robert Dorian Smith has taken a leaf from his ancestor's book. 
Having inherited a depleted family fortune and a near-bankrupt island, Robert renovated the pretty cottages and the now world-famous Abbey Gardens into a perfectly manicured timeshare complex. Robert owns everything on Tresco, including the pub, the shop and everyone's homes. It is a sometimes benevolent dictatorship. Living on Tresco, even living on Tresco as opposed to living on St. Mary's or St. Martin's or Briar or St. Agnes, is very unique because uh, it's a private island for starters. It's a private estate and um, everybody here works for the same person right? and, uh, and it all works. It's a very sort of feudal environment which creates a sort of wonderful sense of security. Security on Tresco can be a fairly short-lived affair. Most of the old tenant cottages have been turned into timeshare accommodation, and as tourism has become the big earner, stable long-term agricultural and fishing tenancies have been replaced with short-term holiday jobs. Well, I'd never heard about the place, so I had to research into like where the Isles of Scilly were. I actually thought it was somewhere in Europe, but then um, I got out a map, and on the atlas it was like, you know, the island's right down the bottom of Cornwall. So I thought, you know, it sounds pretty decent. And in the letter, Heather actually said um, there's no lighting on the island and, you know, it's very remote if you, you know, if you want a social life. It isn't the place to come. But, I mean, it's everything you want. It's so relaxed. There's, and all the locals are so friendly and everything. So she, she actually thought that young people wouldn't appreciate it for what it is. But it's just, it's brilliant. There's so many kids here having a good time and stuff. Tresco store is expensive, but it has all the basics that you, you can get away with. So um, you can shop there and there's a co-op on St Mary's. So for that sort of thing, you're fine. You just don't quite get the range you'd get in Sainsbury's or somewhere like that. So um, and everything everything's more expensive. Um, but say you, just, you, you know you have to put up with these things to live here. Really, people here are very 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 safe. You cannot really. Be unsafe on Tresco, and it, unless you do something stupid, you know. And um, it's wonderful. So it's so as a painter, and being alone, and being able to walk at any hour of the day or night, with a sense of freedom and peace and calm, the sorts of things I'm trying to inflict in my painting. I couldn't do that successfully if I didn't feel it. You see. Now I don't think I'd be feeling that way in Cornwall, West Cornwall. I wouldn't have the, the freedom to just walk, get out and walk, and not be frightened, and to set up and look and spend hours doing it. And if somebody does come, to not jump in a bush, you know, and hide for being afraid. The arrangement works as long as you've got a job, but the chances of today's children finding a job with a house to retire to at the end of it are very slim indeed. The upside is an unspoilt, virtually crime-free environment. Well, we've had um, 11 crimes so far this year, um, as against 50, just about 50 last year. Um, it's a safe environment, and locals want to keep it that way. So we end up um, being able to find out who our visitor is, who's on the island, and even where they're staying, and how long they've been here, and what they've been doing, and everything else, because. Uh, it's a bit like a, a large version of Coronation Street, I really. I suppose everybody knows quite a bit about everybody else. So we assist the public, and the public assists us, really, to try and to keep the, the criminal element to a minimum. It's been likened to policing sort of 20 to 30 years ago. Um, and although I've not experienced, my dad was a, a local Bobby many years ago um, in a small village. And, you know, he says that it is the same. You can, we've got a good relationship with a lot of people, a lot of coffee stops. Um, which does help, you know, a great deal because we can find out what's going on and that's the main thing, really. It's probably one of the most rewarding jobs that you can get in the police force um, because of the, the way that the, the community here respond to you. Um, you know, they love their policemen. Um, I, you know, I say that to a lot of people, but they do. And they will, you know, there are instances where, um, for instance, uh, uh, an instance I had in the, one of the pubs recently, 
um, I had difficulty with a few, lo a few visiting youngsters um, who wanted to fight. Um, I had to escort them away back to where they were staying. Um, and in doing so, I was aware of a group following me. When I inquired who they were, they were all local um, youths or local young men who were following me to make sure I was all right. So that's the degree of um, camaraderie that goes on between us and the locals. And that, you know, that makes it a very rewarding job. And you can help people out and you can see the end to what you're doing. I much prefer to be part of a small community uh, and to feel the sort of safety and security that there is in that. Um, yeah, that's what I miss most when I'm on the mainland, and that's what I look for, you know, when I'm when I'm doing things or joining things over there. Um, so, and I think it's made me more aware of, you know, how to get on in a community and uh, how to make it work rather than it become because small communities sort of can become difficult because you're obviously so isolated. But um, I think, you know, if you've lived out here and seen how you have to get along with other people and where there's no choice, I think it makes you more tolerant of people um, that you're stuck with, you know, in, in other situations. So it was a good, it was a good basis for that. But uh, at the same time, it can also make you a bit more, um, a bit more apprehensive of sort of, sit, not sit, well, cities, you know, larger areas, places where you're sort of, uh, you know, you're just a face, you're not, you're not a person to other people. Um, that's one thing I found when, you know, when I went away. It was, uh, you know, the contrast between the community spirit over here and then the sort of facelessness of the places where I went on the mainland. So, um, it's a sort of good, you know, it helped me, you know, live in a community, but it also made me more aware of, of being a face in the crowd as well. Oh, it's a nice life, yeah. It's nice to live here, but it's all probably a bit sheltered in a way, I suppose, really. It's not... It's hardly the real world, is it? But it's, it's nice, yeah. Yeah. People come for a fortnight and they think, this is heaven, this is... There's no stress, no worries, you know, we don't have to worry about time, but if you actually live here, it isn't like that at all. You know, we've still got boats to catch, we've still got stuff to get onto market on time. We still got to deal with the weather. And in the winter time, that is a problem sometimes. You know, if we don't if we don't get a boat and we've got flowers bunched ready to go, we've got a cold store them and it gets very frustrating. It's the freedom. You can you can leave your door unlocked. You can leave the key in your car. You know, you can do what you like. You can walk into a shop and say, you know, oh, bugger, I've got no money on me. I'll be in tomorrow and walk out. You can't do that on the mainland. They're watching, you've got cameras watching you all the time in case you pinch something. Don't worry about that here. You can't put a price on that. I work on the boats through the summer. Uh, work on these passenger boats carrying people around the islands. And, uh, taken them to the islands and around the islands for birds and seals and scenic trips. That's just through the summer months while we've got visitors here from the islands. In the winter I basically have to find some employment just to keep the money coming in. So our labouring work or whatever work's going really. Every weekend or maybe after school we'd all, we'd all go for a picnic on some island or something, take a boat out. Which is, which is really fun. The best bit was the freedom we have. You know, most people had to go back from school and stay in the house and not be allowed out by themselves, but we had the whole island to go and get up to stuff. And it was just, it was just nice to be able to get away from everything and do our own thing. No rules, no restrictions. It was good. <laughs> Some still manage to work a traditional living from Scilly, and you'll find them in the island's watering holes. It's hard because you've only got a summer months, really, to make your income to last you through the winter, because obviously the winters are very hard. So you start sort of April, and then usually sort of October, to end of September, October time, you know, weather sort of 
makes a break and you know you may be lucky to go to November so it's it's hard you know so you've got to try and make your money in that short space of time to last you through the winter like when you know you obviously can't go fishing for the weather. With few shops and no cinema locals spend the dark winter months competing in their favorite sport. But drinking is as much competition as any sport I think um, we have terrific rivalry between the islands but it's very friendly uh, we have gig racing obviously which is a great deal of rivalry uh, between each crew and then uh, off-island cricket which we uh, we play against Tresco and St Martin's quite a bit Tris is the skipper um, and there's a lot of friendly rivalry in that which is healthy I think I mean the, the community centre which is the only thing place it was originally set up so you can go and do things there that's due to storm and just neglect it's sort of fallen apart and there's part of the roof come off and and it's derelict basically there are two pubs on the island and that's it I mean you can go swimming if the weather's nice you go to different islands but I mean there's three people my age on this island as well so I mean there's there's just nobody really I mean just isolated, it's like living on a piece of rock in the Atlantic Ocean, like we are. They've got their own character, the islands. You've got lovely beaches, it's uncrowded. You can still come out and have a party like this in the night. So, it's got everything, really. It's different to what I thought it would be. It's, it's a lot friendlier, it's a lot safer. Really like it, yeah, it's great. I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's a great place, there's a lot of um, beauty going on and natural beauty, but I don't know, sometimes I feel like I want to branch out, I don't know. It tends to, now you get a bit older, you sort of explored everything and there's not as much to do now around, so it's, it gets a bit boring and you want to get away to the mainland more and do different things. Perhaps the rest of the world really is catching up with these islands. The old traditional methods of earning a living are fast disappearing, at the same rate as the expectations of the youngsters is rising. Prue and Emily grew up in what certainly looks like paradise, but it's not out of this world and nothing lasts forever. Silly, but I'm not sure that I'm actually a Salonian or ever destined to be. Uh, I can't see myself staying out here uh, and carving a life for myself. And uh, I've been going away for uh, well 10 years now for my education. So for a good part of the year, I'm away on the mainland anyway. So um, I've sort of forged myself a, a life over there rather than over here. I think in the long run. Marry a Salonian? Um, I don't. I don't think. I mean, I guess if I was like truly in love, I would. But, I mean, there's nothing... It's just the winter, I think, that gets me down over here. I can't find any work. It's just holiday work. And then in the winter, it's cold and wet, and you can't get any food over because, say, the weather's awful and the boats aren't running. And it's, you know, it's just too isolated over the winter over here for me, definitely. What we're looking at right now is uh, what people looked at thousands of years ago. It's the type of environment that I think people are going to aspire to be in. If they can't be in it physically, they'll aspire some other way to be in a state like, like the one that people are when they're here. It's time, you know, so it's, it's a privilege to have it. Silly is a treasure trove, but the jewels belong to the crown.